going to be uh, continuing on in our series in the Book of Ephesians. Now, for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about unity. And that's because that's where the theme is in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And see, after addressing um, the issue of God's desire to reveal his mystery of global unity between Jews and Gentiles, under the New Covenant, Paul continues to instruct the Ephesians to encourage them to live their lives in sync with their calling by living out their faith in unity in their local assemblies. In overview of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul's letter brings with it, uh, I would say, a good balance between doctrine and unity. And if you look at the book of Ephesians very closely, you'll see that it's themed out. And in the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul weighs in heavily on instruction concerning doctrine. And um, we see transition in chapter 4 where you see this real emphasis on doctrine switches gears to become the application of how good doctrine affects how we approach our relationship with the Lord, how we approach our relationship with other believers, and also how we approach our relationships in the world around us that is without Christ. And um, this all affects how good doctrine affects how we treat each of those uh, groups of people. Now, I'll, I'll say this, that sound doctrine is important to God. He desires for us to have it, but sometimes doctrine becomes doctrine for the sake of taking pride in getting it right, and say, intellectually. But sound doctrine, actually, the purpose that God has for us to have soundness in doctrine is that it translates into practical living that glorifies Him. And after all is said and done, we started uh, we started Ephesians, and now we're going to start to talk about application of the doctrinal things that we've laid down in the first three chapters. Now, I don't know if any of you know when Christians started to be called Christians, but the history books tell us that Christians first started being called Christians in the church in Antioch, which is uh, outside of Jerusalem, was the main church that started out. And it was a spearhead into the Gentile world. We see Paul um, going on his missionary journey from Antioch. There was a great uh, number of believers, both Jews and Gentiles, in Antioch. And when you Think of what Christian means. Now, they may have said it as a slight. The Jews might have started calling it a Christian. But what Christian means is Christ-like one. Christ-like one. And my message this morning is about coming to maturity through unity in Christ. And the text is Ephesians 4. Now, I was planning on preaching a lion's share of this chapter, and I got stuck on the first six verses. <laughs> so the text this morning is the first six verses. The, the first six verses are just so full of truth and application of that truth that we can take home with us. So Paul starts, and we'll start with the first two verses in Ephesians chapter 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Wow, just stop. After reading those three verses, does that strike you as being countercultural? 
sure does listen. In recognition, my friends, of all that God did by setting us free as believers through the work of Jesus and bringing us all together into one family under Jesus. Paul is suggesting now that we have choices to make. There's choices for us. And he urges the Ephesians to live a life that is worthy of their call. And let's look at this. When we came to Jesus, we were given a new lease on life. Our sins are forgiven by the work of Jesus on the cross. The blood was shed so that he died in our place. He died in our stead. And once we're cleaned by the sacrificial work of Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in and he takes residence inside of our spirit and we become a new creation. We're set free from the bonds of sin, where we were slaves to sin before. Now, we become servants of righteousness, slaves of righteousness. So what that means is we're no longer slaves to our sins. We've been set free from them, being alienated from God. We have now been brought into unity with him. Atonement. Atonement means being made one with God. Atonement, at one minute. We have also been made one with him for a specific purpose. And that purpose is for us to join his family. See, we've been made one with God and join his spiritual family in unity with all of the other brothers and sisters that we have in Christ. The people sitting next to us, the people that we mingle with that are believers in our community. Now, Paul urges the Ephesians to live a life worthy of their time. If we're to practically preserve the unity of the Spirit amongst the different parts of the body of Christ, which by very nature are very different from one another, there's no one believer sitting here today that's exactly the same as the person next to them. You guys know this. Each of you have different gifts, different callings, different perspectives, different gifts, different weaknesses. If we're going to practically preserve the unity of the Spirit amongst these diverse parts of the body of Christ, we must possess Christ-like graces that Paul speaks to us about in this chapter. This chapter is so important in this day and age for us to absorb the truth that's there, that doctrine that's there, and put it into practice. Firstly, Paul calls us, as believers, to be completely humble. Completely humble. Now, the next thing about the letters to the churches is that they're not always just in one place. Like the, the instructions aren't just found in one place. Here we have it in Ephesians. But other way, other places in the New Testament, the same instruction is given because this is such an important issue. Paul calls us to be completely humble. In Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 8, Paul speaks about it in this particular way. He says this. Starting with verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Paul says, my friends, in Ephesus and throughout the ages, us here today, be completely 
humble. Well, humility. That's not a default of our sinful nature, is it? No, anything but the sin nature that we inherited from Adam when the fall came. That nature is bound and determined to dominate others, to be the top dog, and to be proud. Now notice how Paul doesn't instruct the Ephesians to just be sort of humble. He says, be completely humble. God's desire is really, and this is where it comes down to it, being completely humble. God's desire is that his children become other-centered, sacrificing our own agendas to see that other people around us flourish and advance in God's kingdom. That's what that is talking about. You know, Jesus, our Lord, who is King of kings, Lord of lords, the creator of the entire universe, and had every right to be proud of his position. Yet for our sake, in our lost condition without him, Jesus laid aside his comforts and rights as our king to serve us, to serve our king, to serve his own creation, because he knew that without him serving us, we were lost. We were lost without his assistance. True humility in every relationship is translated into other centeredness. While the opposite of humility is pride. Pride is always self focused, self centered, thinking about me and my rights over others. Pride ruins marriages, it ruins parent child relationships, it ruins friendships. It ruins community and it also ruins churches. When we yield to the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord brings with His presence complete humility. And Paul says, be an imitator of Christ. Be an imitator of the attitude of the Lord. This isn't normal. This isn't what nature from Adam tells us we should do. But this is what the new man in the spirit of Christ tells us not only should we do it, but he compels us and says that we must do it. We must humble ourselves. And secondly, Paul says to them to be Completely gentle. Completely gentle. Another word for gentleness is meekness. Now, you have probably heard this analogy that meekness is, is not weakness. It's not. You see, gentleness, gentleness is the absence of harshness. In the world around us, we know it, right? We've experienced it. It's harsh and it's cruel. It's, it's cold out there. It's tough out there. And one of Satan's primary character traits is his cruelty. But Jesus, on the other hand, is opposite to that. In Matthew 11, 28 to 30, the Lord Jesus said, he said this to his people, to his disciples, which includes you and I. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. See, Jesus our Savior, our Creator. He comes to us and He tells us to lay down our burdens. Lay down your burdens before Him. Burdens that come from living in this cruel, cold world. The Lord promises that when we do this, He'll give us rest. He wants us to be like Him, you see. He wants us to take His yoke upon us. Rather than pulling 
for ourselves and our cruel enemy under a yoke of slavery. Jesus calls us to be hitched to him, to be pulling for him and for his kingdom purposes. So you know, you can't serve your, you can't serve neutrally. You serve God or you serve yourself and the enemy. Right? When you become a believer in Jesus Christ and you get that atonement from the work of Jesus Christ, you're clothed in his righteousness, you become a servant of God. Your master switches from self and the evil one to Jesus Christ and your creator. Right? Jesus Christ, your creator. So, Jesus wants us to be like him. That's, that's why he says, take my yoke upon you. Because he desires for us to transition and to transform. To become like him. And when we do, when we come to him, he promises us that we'll be refreshed and that we can learn from him. He says, learn from me. See, one of the primary character traits of the powerful one who created the universe, who formed us and gave us the breath of life, is that he is completely gentle. And humble in spirit. He's meek. And this is overlooked sometimes by well meaning Christians. It's not overlooked, it's, it's very often minimized. Being Christ like means being completely gentle in our approach to other people. Gentleness, meekness. The origin of the word meek comes from an old Norse word, and I don't even want to pronounce it, M-J-U-K-R, you can pronounce it. You can pronounce it, you tell me how to pronounce that. But that's where the root word of, of meekness comes. And it actually means gentle. But the fuller understanding of that word, I think, comes from a Greek word, pros, which is translated as this. Meekness or gentleness is strength under control. Strength under control. In ancient Greece, war horses were trained to be meek. They were strong and powerful, yet under control and willing to submit to authority. So, meekness biblically is understood as letting God be in control. Not trying to run the show ourselves, but to be gentle by listening to what he says. And he says, the meek shall inherit the earth. It doesn't mean when if you if you approach gentleness, like there's some big tough guys in this room here, right? You're taught to be tough. You know? Tough is okay. But gentleness needs to be at the forefront of our thinking. Strength under control. You know, it's ine inevitable, my friends. It's inevitable that there's going to be wrongs done to us in this world. Like, can anyone say that they haven't been really hurt by someone or something, or a group, or an individual? We're going to get hurt by others when we're part of a family. Whether that family is a biological family or whether that family is a spiritual family called the church. This is just a building. Church is the people. You are the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of it. It's a collection of people that have been broken by all the things in this world. And we've been saved by grace and we've been forgiven. We're imperfect, right? And we're still in a state of repair. There's this process called sanctification, being conformed to the image of Christ. That is a daily thing that God wants us to take to Him. Jesus, help me to be more like you. I dare say some of us could be 
influenced by the scripture, who Paul says, be completely gentle. First Corinthians 13, after all, talks about this. Thirdly, we're encouraged by Paul to be patient or long suffering, bearing with one another in love. This one's tough, at least it is for me. It's absolutely essential for us to stop here and think, hey, how am I at in the patience department? <laughs> Long suffering department. Well, God gives us His grace. He gives us His grace not only to be saved, but He gives us His grace in order to help us to live a life that is pleasing to Him. And one thing that's really pleasing to God is if we are patient with one another. Where we look at one another with eyes of love. And I know that's hard because when we've been hurt, we get wrinkles and hackles up to keep ourselves from getting hurt again. But in Christ, he wants us to take that off and lay it aside and say, okay, God, I haven't got long suffering in my Adamic nature, but I know in your nature you are long suffering and you are gentle. You are gracious to me. Help me, Lord, take me. Lord, change me. Lord, reveal yourself to me. May my spirit mesh. With your spirit, God. First Corinthians 13, 5. We're told in verse 5 about love. The love that God has for us, but the love that God calls us to have for one another. Love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. And it keeps no records of wrong. This is what it means to bear with one another in love. Have you dishonored someone? Have you maligned someone? Have you hurt someone? All of us have. And when we do, we need to recognize it for what it is in the hands. And come to God and say, change me, God. Help me, God, not to be that person that tries to take it out and, and gets my own vengeance. Have you been wronged? Have you been hurt? Have you ever been hurt so bad where you, you have this grudge and you can't let it go in your flesh? You're not the only one. Everybody has this, right? When, when we get hurt, the natural reaction is just to guard ourselves. And even, you know, you watch programs on TV and all these stories that come out in these different programs, and, and vengeance is very popular. Let's get even. Right? Well, as a believer, we're called to love on other people, not get even. It's not easily angered. Keeps no records of wrong. We gotta let it go. We gotta let it go. In that Jesus name. You know, bearing with one another in love. Paul tells us that when we're wrong, the God glorifying response is what? Help me forgive others. Forgive others when they sin against us, just as God in Christ forgave us. In our anger, our first reaction might be to dishonor the person that hurt us. Maybe to bash them behind the scenes to save face because they've maligned us. This is bearing with one another in mind. Long suffering, called by Christ to immediately, immediately 
and completely release any grudges that I've had against a person and to treat them as though we had never done anything wrong to you. Oh, oh. That's a toughie, isn't it? Isn't that tough? We wrestled with that one. We can't do this in our own strength, can we? Not a chance. We don't have it in our old nature. But don't forget this. The atonement means not just the cleansing of your sins, but it means the unity between you and God and your spirit. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ dwells inside of you as a believer. There is atonement at the one man. Therefore, you don't have to listen to the old man, the old lady that's inside, vying for control. You are no longer slaves to sin. You have been given freedom in Christ, which means now you have a choice. Where before you were under compulsion and you couldn't change. Now it's a matter of recognition and submission in obedience to God's call. And that's why Paul instructs them and says, be completely gentle. Mm. No. Oh, I don't really know why some people have hurt me the way they have over the last few years. All of us have experienced this. It just seems like there's been an intensification of hurt on all kinds of fronts. I don't know about you, but you've probably been really hurt too. I haven't really hurt. I don't, I don't really know why people have hurt me the way they have. I, I don't know. I don't really have the full story. I don't really know all the things that that person has inside that came out after me. I know that realistically, it's not probably something that was spawned out of pure vengeance. It's probably they're carrying something else, and I happen to be on the receiving end of their frustration. You have to remember this. See, anyone that hurts us, probably somewhere along the lines, you can hurt yourself. And God knows this. See? And we need to release people that hurt us into his hands and let God take care of us. He knows how to deal with people. He knows how to deal with me. And I see how he's dealt with me when I've been the one that's dishing them out. Because I have. I've hurt people. Many people. And thankfully, thankfully, all of us can agree on this as, as Christians, for sure. That we've never really received what we really deserve, have we? In ourselves, we deserve wrath. We deserve punishment. But the Lord has forgiven us and he's shown us mercy because of his long-suffering patience. We call it his amazing grace. And the reason Paul calls us to be this way, he's calling the Ephesians to be this way, to let go of our egos, is that there are more important things at stake than our feelings on any one issue. Unity brought by the Holy Spirit through the bond of peace, I'm going to say this, is more important than my hurt feelings. Viewing things in this way takes us a long way on the path to Christian maturity. Does this mean that we're never to confront evil behaviors when they're tearing people apart? They're tearing the church apart, tearing a family apart? Absolutely not. Keeping unity in the bond of peace doesn't mean that we let everything go and just not hold people responsible for the things they're doing. We don't hold them accountable for sin. In the passage I just read to you in Romans, I'm 
I'm going to read this again. Do not repay anyone for evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will be burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the first I read this. I'm supposed to read it back to the stick. But Romans 12, 18, what it says there, if, it poss- if it's all possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And that's what he's saying here in our text in Ephesians. God's given us a prescription for dealing with problems and sin. He's given us that prescription in the word, but how we do this is pivotally important. And if we want to see unity in the spirit, we cannot afford to approach problems that come our way and hurts that come our way and issues and sins that come upon us with immaturity. What do you think about when you think about immaturity in relationships? Uh, Many pictures come to mind. I probably threw that out there. There's probably as many pictures as there are people in here, and they're all different. Well, when I think of immaturity in relationships, you know what I think of? I think of little children playing in a sandbox. And the one kid has a toy that the other kid wants, and the other kid thinks that the toy belongs to them. so they grab the toy and they say, mine! And the other kid goes, no, mine! Mine! And then there's screaming and crying and all kinds of drama. Drama, 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 drama. Ah! Oh. You're a parent, you're, oh, boy. here we go again. Right? That's what I think about when I think about oh, yeah. immaturity and dealing with problems. Children fighting over toys in the sandbox. Hustle occurs. You see, all of us have this nature when it comes to God. We're we're immature. You look at the creator of the universe and you you, you put him beside human uh, maturity, and we're like those little toddlers in the sandbox, really. <laughs> it's a good way of thinking about it, right? And God desires for us to learn. Learn how to approach conflict resolution with maturity. Um, when we're wrong, and count on it, we're going to get wronged. Probably this week by someone. How do we respond to this? God wants us to learn how to rightly respond to this. In James 5 9, we're told that when we're wrong, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. See, the temptation is when I'm wronged by another person is to react and to grumble against that person. This is where gossip comes from. It's a solemn warning. If we do this, we will place ourselves under the judgment of God. And as believers, what that means is we're going to be subjected to God's discipline. It's a fearful thing to have to fall into the hands of the living God. Friends, if we don't learn, if we don't grow, we're going to get disciplined because he loves us. He's not a cruel, you know, tyrant of a father. He is, remember, completely gentle, completely humble. When he disciplines his children, he does what's best for us. But, oh, my goodness, we don't want to have to learn that way, do we? Particularly when he instructs us in his word and he gives us the ability to, to see how we navigate this. Hmm. Have you told lies about someone? Ask God for forgiveness and ask that person for forgiveness. Now, lies been told about you? Have you been rejected? Maybe you've been the victim of abuse. Perhaps a broken promise. You've been cheated. You've been betrayed in your confidence. The natural reaction is to be angry. But in our anger, we're told not to sin. 
It's okay to not like it. It doesn't feel good. You don't just say, oh, that felt really good, that knife in my back. <laughs> uh, that's not what we're talking about here. It's like, no, that hurts. It really hurt, but I choose. I choose to give this to God. I choose to lay it down. And say, God, you take care of this, because I can't. I don't know how to. I don't know the first thing on how to unravel that complicated person that just did that to me. You have to take this because I can't do anything with this. What I can do is what I can do. And then the rest belongs to you. Ephesians 4. We continue here. 4, 4 to 6. Right in line with what I'm saying. It says, make every effort to keep unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. The Lord, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all. Contextually, you realize this is talking about unity. That's what this verse is, this passage is all about. We take piecemeal of this, but when we look at the whole thing in context, it's talking about love and unity, being completely humble and gentle, being Christ-like, having the graces of Christ living through us with good doctrine, acting it out in the real world. Here's a piece of pastoral advice for you. If you're dealing with the pain of someone's sin against you, Write down how that sin, always in your own place, in your own time. Write down everything that's happened and how that sin has affected you. And name each and every way that the sin has hurt you. And over each way that that sin has hurt you, you pray and you ask the Lord. forgive them and help me to forgive them too. Finally, tell them that you want to heal that pain in the that they've caused. And then let them go into the hands of God. Does that mean that you're going to be able to fellowship with that person? Not unless there's re reconciliation done. But it releases you. It releases you. Forgiveness releases you from this, from this dark cloud of bitterness that has its way of settling on us when we don't. We need to let God take it. And we can't do it ourselves. So what does it mean? What does it mean to make every effort to keep unity in the spirit through the bond of peace? Um, we're going to talk about this. When there's unrepentance in the family, when that person will not take responsibility for the harm they've caused and the hurt they've caused. When we make every effort to keep unity in the bond, in, in the spirit through the bond of peace, well, friends, the scriptures give us prescription on how we're to approach these things. Galatians 6 1 says, Brothers and sisters, what if someone's caught in a sin? Is there any sinners here today that have sinned? <laughs> what happens if we're caught in sin? What would we appreciate from the people around us when we come to our senses and we realize that um, maybe we've messed it up? Okay. Galatians 6 1 tells us this. Brothers and sisters, when what if someone's caught in a sin? Then you who live by the Spirit should correct that person. So that means if I've sinned against you, then the proper course of action for you is to come to me and say, Hey, you've heard me. You've sinned against me. Well, maybe I uh, had a bad day, you know. Like all of us do sometimes. I woke up on the wrong side of the bed and the dog chewed up whatever and maybe I had to clean up the nests and the children and 
my car broke down and I'm frustrated and I'm angry and you happen to be standing there at the wrong time. <laughs> and I sin against you. I say something cruel, right? Or, you know, and it hurts you. The proper course of action for you to say, hey, brother, what are you doing? You're, you just sinned against me. It's not right. I love you. I care about you, but you can't treat me that way. That's not that's not that's not Christ. Right, that's the proper course of action. And you know what? Do it in a gentle way. It says here, do it in a gentle way, but be careful, because you can be tempted too. So if you've been sinning against you can confront this in a gentle way. But just remind, be reminded that you're also subject to being a sinner too. So when you're approaching someone, you have that in mind. You see, unity in the kingdom of God is all important. The unity in the body of Christ must be restored. And we are to have make every effort to do this. <sighs> but despite that, right, we've done everything we can think of to restore a person who refuses gentle correction. <laughs> you know the sin. Maybe they don't see it. Now, there's a different prescription for that, but when, when someone refuses this, when that happens, we have to take further action. In the church in Corinth, there was a problem. And we're going to be doing communion here today, but I'm going to talk about this. There was a problem that needed to be dealt with prior to the establishment, reestablishment of unity in that church. In the church in Corinth, there was a break in unity. Now let's take a quick look at the scenario. So what was happening, guys, is in this early church, the problem was that people were gathering together on the Lord's Day, like we do here on Sunday, and they started this tradition that we had of communion. Now, we all have communion traditions that we've learned from our various branches of where we were rooted in Christian Christendom, and each of us has a different idea of what should be done and how it should be done and everything, and it's going to maybe be different than the next person sitting beside you. But one thing that these guys were doing in Corinth when they were trying to establish how you do communion okay, is they don't bring lunch to church, to the church meeting. And they would sit down and they'd start to have lunch. Treating it like any ordinary meal. They approached the ceremony of communion like they would for lunch for their own family at home. But not only this, were they not recognizing the broken body and blood of Christ, which was in itself wrong, they were selfish about what they were doing. They were exclusive. Some people who were wealthy and had plenty were feeding their own families and their own little group without consideration for those among them who were poor and who had nothing. So people were gorging themselves in the middle of this church meeting while other people were going hungry because they didn't have anything. Now we don't have that issue so much in North America because we have plenty everywhere we look. But in that particular culture, there were people that were hungry. They didn't have a lot of food, some of them. And some had plenty. And the Corinthians were going and they were gorging themselves at the table, sitting next to brothers and sisters that were just like, they had nothing. And they're like, oh, oh, oh. here, kids, have some more. You know, have triple helpings. And there's a guy next to them that had nothing. And this was selfishness. It was all focused on me, 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 mine, 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 me, me, mine. Selfishness is the devil's religion. Paul's addressing this. He says, wow, what's going on here? Now, there's no sharing like we do here when we have a bottle of lunch after service. Some of them were actually gorging themselves and drinking wine. And they were getting drunk right in the middle of the service. Paul says in the following directives, in 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 22, in the following directives, I have no praise for you, he says, for your meetings do more harm than good. 
In the first place, I hear that when you come together in the church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there has to be difference to, uh, among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers, and as a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. So, Paul steps in and publicly corrects the Corinthians in mass, on mass. He addresses the entire congregation. And why did he do this? He did this to restore broken unity because what they were doing was breaking unity in the flock. Breaking unity in the bond of peace. Now sometimes Christian leadership in, in submission to God is called to publicly address a wrong and breaking unity in the bond of peace. And this is an example of that kind of aggression. So, there's a scriptural prescription for it, right? Paul addresses it. He says, hey, guys, think about other people. Don't just think about yourself. The other sin here, completely humble and gentle. There are other times when sin in the camp is less public, but never with less harmful to unity. And unity, again, needs to be restored. In the Gospels, Jesus deals with this kind of issue where he instructs his disciples. He says in Matthew 18, 5 to 17, if your brother or sister sinned against you, go to them. Tell them what they did wrong. Sometimes people do stuff wrong and, we don't even, and they don't even realize it. It's good for us to go and tell them. And then you can then you can sort it out, right? Oh, there's a misunderstanding here. Oh, I didn't mean that. Okay. Keep it between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them back. But what if they won't listen to you? Well, then it says take one or more, one or two others with you. Scripture says every matter must be proved by words of two or three witnesses. So get some people that are trustworthy and bring them with you to this meeting. Someone neutral, preferably. Take two or three others. And what if they refuse also to listen to these witnesses? So you sit down and you try and hash it out and it's just digging in. No! There's no acknowledgement of sin or even if there's a disagreement in there's no agreement to agree to disagree at peace. Right? There's digging in on the heels. No, I'm not going to bend. Pride becomes the dominating factor here. Well, what does it say then? <coughs> what if they refuse to listen to the witnesses? Then tell it to the church and bring it to church leadership. And what if they refuse to listen even to the church? Then don't treat them as a brother or sister. Treat them as you would treat an ungodly person or a tax collector. You have nothing to do with it. Does that sound harsh? Do you mind? You see, you, you understand what I'm saying here? That is not the default. That's not where we go to immediately. And so many Christians get this wrong. They jump on the wrong track. And they start out in the wrong places. Rather than following the scriptural prescription, they jump all over the map and end up doing a lot of harm. A lot of harm. Unity is important to Jesus. And it's so important to him. And it's important on a number of counts. Jesus said in John 17, 11, I will not remain in the world any longer. But they are still in the world. And this is his prayer to the Father before he is, ascends into heaven. I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them safe by the power of your name. It is the name you gave me. Keep them safe. Why? So they can be one, just as you and I are one. Okay. Paramount importance, unity. The truth of the first reason is disclosed in John 17 to 21. There's two reasons. And I'm going to end with that. Father, I pray that they will be one just as you are in me and I am in you. I want them also to be in us. Then the world will believe that you have sent me. 
The Church of Christ is called to be a light to the unbelieving world so that people will come to believe that Jesus is God the Son, that he is the Savior, and that he has been sent into the world by God the Father to rescue humanity from destruction. And without unity, that message does not go out clearly to them, and they turn their back and walk away. And that is not pleasing to God. Hmm. Our unity is of paramount importance because of that. And also, in Romans 15, 5 to 6, Paul also prays for the believers in Rome, saying, May God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify God and the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. God wants unity because we're brothers and sisters and we're part of the family. He wants the family to be whole and to be healthy so that we can glorify him and he's glorified when we care for one another. Which first two commands, right? Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what glorifies God. So unity brings glory to God. Maybe you had a hard family. My family roots, my grandfathers on both sides did terrible damage to our family. My parents got saved. My parents actually originally ran away to start their own thing because they didn't like what they were raised with. And both of them came to know Christ, and I was raised in a Christian environment where they treated us well. I had the grace of God in my home. Thank the Lord. I am like what they had. I came to Christ when I was just a little guy. They came to Christ when I was three years old. I have so much to be thankful for. Because the unifying that took place under the Lordship of Christ, the faith in Christ. And as a result of unity that Christ brought, what we're talking about here today, I had a healthy place to grow up. And that's not what you see out there in the world. And you guys are carrying you know, all kinds of wounds with you. Everyone here has wounds. I'm telling you, there's light in Christ. These principles that we're talking about here bring life and peace. And they shine like stars in the universe if we are obedient. Again, we have the choice, though, right? 